We have great team here. So, Francisco Javier Lopez Gruba. I'm missing one. It's You're the Y. Yeah. <laughs> Francisco is a senior ecosystem solution architect at Red Hat, experienced senior advocate for open source emerging technologies, embracing the ethos of fail fast, fail often. Yeah. I like that very much. Yeah, but not today. But not today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just not today. Yeah. Mate Bogovic, an engineering manager at Cross, a local from Zadar here. So if you need olive oil on prosciutto, reach out to Mate. If you want some more expensive olive, olive oil and prosciutto, reach out to me. Uh, quality price, you know. So, uh, Mate uh, is one of our managers here in Zadar. We have a Zadar office for everybody who wants to do some on-site workshops in Zadar. Uh, Mate has an interest in driving growth and innovation, especially with Red Hat, family and products, and especially in DAH and CEE region. And last, Dino Shimichev is a proactive and experienced senior engineer at Cross and lately his focus switched to AI and ML world. So guys, tell me what's OpenShift's approach in navigating AI transformation? A simple question. Well, basically my job was to introduce you two, so I guess my job is done. <laughs> uh, and by the way, my oil is better than his oil, just to get that off the table. Yeah, uh, on the serious note, uh, yeah, for the last two, almost three days, we covered uh, quite a few topics. Of course, major one, or one of the major ones, uh, was uh, AI. Uh, we heard different opinions, perspectives, views, approaches. We heard or seen how uh, Sarah is hoping that she will some, that AI will help her, help her generate time, how our, our her way uh, approached uh, to, to AI in a way to remove or minimize his concerns. We saw our panelists yesterday talking about AI solutions and uh, is there any or are there any business problems that we are solving or we are now that we have such a powerful solution trying to find the problems. After that, we saw a couple of great sessions where we actually saw how the AI-based uh, solutions were applied and resolved some great, great and complex business cases. So yeah, different uh, views, different concerns, but in general, I think everybody agrees AI is here to stay and uh, it will or really already is changing our uh, industry. In this talk, uh, we will talk about uh, AI in general, but also with may maybe more focus on the platform, the Red Hat OpenShift AI platform. And uh, yeah, uh, Red Hat as a company needs no introduction. I think everybody in the room heard for uh, about OpenShift, RHEL, or uh, AAP, but uh, as they sit their CTO stated, on one of the Red Hat conferences, nobody or small portion of people are um, uh, perceiving Red Hat as an AI company at this moment. So, uh, and they are really, really investing a lot of time and great engineering to change that. And they are on the great, great uh, way with this uh, platform. We in Cross have been playing with it, doing a couple of complex POCs and uh, yeah, we actually really like what we are seeing. So I'm pretty confident that OpenShift AI will be the fourth pillar of Red Hat coming after the OpenShift RHEL and, and uh, AAP, or even going before them. But I think I'm talking too long. Uh, yeah, uh, Dino uh, prepared uh, short and simple demo just for you to have a look and feel how the OpenShift uh, AI platform looks like. And now, without further ado, I would like to uh, 
not give the mic, you have the mic, but put, let uh, Francisco tell you more details about this great platform. Thank you. So yes, um, as you heard before, my name is Francisco, and I have several other names, which uh, <laughs> at the end uh, of the presentation, uh, yeah, you, you have to name them all, right? No, um, joking aside, so uh, the challenge um, for me as a Red Hat employee long year, a long term uh, Red Hat employee is to explain uh, the importance of a platform in combination with uh, yeah, our new uh, flagship uh, OpenShift AI and um, yeah, um, do a value proposition or showcase the value of it, right? So <clears throat> um, it is quite important to um, explain what Red Hat is really doing. So my question to you at this point is uh, who of you really knows what OpenShift is? So I see a lot of cross hands <laughs> and a red hat hand. Okay, so um, first of all, um, our um, yeah, go-to-market, our credo, our DNA is the operating system. Right? When I started uh, to work for Red Hat in the UK in, the 20, in 2010, um, it was all about the operating system. So you need to know the kernel, you need to know the services, you need to know how everything works, right? Deep down and really, um, yeah, uh, to the core. Um, important for you, the audience, at this point is just simply one thing. Open, so Red Hat is a company with an open source oriented development model, right? And this is, applies to everything, to the operating system, which is our red line, our core, for everything, and we build up on top of it, and um, yeah, everything else. So, um, which means that our developers are basically paid to commit uh, code changes or implementations upstream. Upstream is the bleeding edge for us, right, uh, in terms of open source. Um, Back in the days, in the 2010s, right, uh, Linux wasn't always that stable. When I started to use Linux, not Rel or Red Hat Linux, right, later on, um, I was uh, using uh, many derivatives, and um, yeah, we we uh, worked really hard to make it as stable as today, rock solid, right. So um, yeah, that's point number one. So we have a lot of experience uh, to build platforms. Uh, we, we own the operating system. And um, yeah, maybe in 2012, uh, we started uh, yeah, to discover new uh, horizons, right? It's like we were all in in emerging technologies, what we call emerging technologies. Back in the days, it was a uh, big hype, like uh, technologies like OpenStack, maybe uh, some of you might remember, and also OpenShift shortly after, right? Um, it was a process. Uh, OpenShift um, relies today on top, well, on Kubernetes as a um, orchestrate, container orchestration uh, platform, right? Um, but that wasn't always the case. What you see here, is the complete product family we uh, created um, in this whole OpenShift uh, backslash Kubernetes ecosystem. So, uh, and we addressed each and every aspect of um, yeah uh, modern infrastructure. Yeah, always with the paradigm of a DevOps platform uh, in mind. GitOps was always uh, the way we worked, as you might know. The kernel is using uh, heavily Git, right, to commit sources. It was even uh, one of the inventions uh, which we um, actually have because of the Linux kernel. Um, but we also addressed um, not only the infrastructure side, um, observability, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, but also everything that comes on top, so the uh, workload um, itself, right. Um, 
yeah, there is a management layer with advanced cluster management. There is a security uh, tool, uh, which we call advanced cluster security. We have a global registry um, with Red Hat Quay. And we also own uh, a storage solution, which is uh, the OpenShift Data Foundation, which is based on Ceph. Who knows Ceph? Software defined storage. Yeah, cool. OK. Um, but let us go ahead. We, I mean, all, all that is complex. We all agree on this, all right? Um, the point uh, we wanted to address because of this is to abstract away complexity. If you look at OpenShift today, it really um, addresses everything you need uh, and uh, abstracts away many of the super complex processes we know from uh, classical infrastructure. And um, the first thing we wanted to achieve is really build a hybrid platform <clears throat> for uh, each and every um, provider you're going to find out there. This includes um, hypervisor, so hypervisors uh, as you have them in your own data center, but also um, at the same time uh, hyperscalers, right? We integrate in those APIs. And as you can see here, um, there are no gaps. There are maybe tiny gaps, right? So niche, but it's like mostly uh, we are really in there, in that game, right? We also do um, bare metal, um, yeah. Uh, we, we implemented a lot. So there are two modes of installation. It's the user-defined uh, installation, um, UPI, uh, and the IPI, which is an autopilot installation kind of right, thing, uh, which um, makes it really simple to, init uh, to initiate uh, an install of a complete cluster, which is HA, which is already complex, right? And it's, um, yeah, and, ex uh, and it's existing. So all this led after, yeah, I don't know, more than 10 years development, uh, led to a situation where the market perception is something we should mention today. Because uh, maybe this also opens the eyes for, for you as an uh, audience today a little bit. So first of all, I would like to, so these are just two um, slides. Uh, from coming from the business side, right? So first of all, I would like to show you uh, the Gartner slide for container management. What you see over there in the uh, leader segment, there are the hyperscalers, um, but there's also Red Hat, right, in terms of container management. And there's a reason for that. And the, the, um, maybe one thing that is not that obvious is uh, we aren't Hyper, uh, we, we are not a hyperscaler. We are not owning data centers. We do not provide services for end customers, right? We do that with partners uh, for managed services with AWS or Microsoft or whatsoever, but uh, we are still there. This means that our uh, maturity of the platform has reached um, really uh, a level that is comparable to hyperscalers, which means a lot, I think. And um, yeah, then we come to this slide. So if you can't see it from the back, the dot on the right side in the corner, upper right corner, that's Red Hat. So we really knocked it out of the park um, in terms of a multi-container platform. And this is, um, yeah, it, it was simply um, awesome, right? It, unbelievable that we achieved that. But um, it's uh, basically the result of hard work. Um, so we always build up our, so we, we own the operating system, I told you that, but we always had um, the vision to um, create a multi-platform, uh, multi-cloud platform that enables each and every customer to, um, yeah, <coughs> uh, how do you say, to uh, prevent uh, vendor lock-in because at the end of the day, it's based on Kubernetes, right? Everything is open source. Uh, we have some secret source in it, right? Um, but um, the customer is, has always the freedom to choose where to build um, his platform. And he also can streamline his processes, which is a big benefit. 
So, but let us um, come back to the core topic. So we want to talk about OpenShift AI. Yeah, I think it's um, necessary to uh, know a little bit about OpenShift um, to understand why OpenShift AI is has so much uh, is bringing so much value to the table. So uh, data scientists, like every other developer, uh, don't want wait time. Right? It's like they just want to do their job. They want to uh, play around with the data, etc. And that's exactly what they um, get when they work with our platform. And they are um, independent from the ground, uh, groundwork, right? from the platform they are actually doing their work on. So we had a lot of panel, so we had a lot of presentations from data, from Damir, which was also an excellent session, um, actually uh, introducing the state of the art uh, use cases, right, and uh, approaches to uh, AI. And um, those are um, existent all over the place in each and every industry. So there are really astonishing uh, achievements. And um, of course, um, more than ever, uh, there is a need for streamlined processes, especially when uh, connecting AI. So just here, the um, uh, headline for OpenShift AI, what it is, right? Um, our aim is to provide a full lifecycle uh, management platform for AI without actually, um, yeah, uh, without vendor lock-in. Um, we have a strategy in there, right? So, as always, there is an upstream project which is called Open Data Hub. Um, if you are familiar with um, Python and uh, the whole ecosystem, you need to actually build up systems for AI, right? You already know this is in itself a co uh, an independent complex world, right? Connecting to um, the infrastructure you need for that. Um, yeah, so we just want to um, connect all this and there are um, also other products like the developer hub baked uh, on backstage um, that need to help, uh, that are there to help us uh, to uh, bring it to the enterprise. So um, our platform is able to do it in yeah, from one hand, so you can actually develop, train, uh, serve, and monitor, and also manage um, your models and applications from there. You have your front ends also on the same platform um, that are um, basically containers. So why containers? Um, yeah, uh, for AI, because it uh, is uh, simply the pets and cattle approach. Um, we are bringing that to the table. <coughs> So, um, AI versus ML. I think uh, for me it was important to uh, bring that topic up um, because what we hear a lot is um, generative AI is um, the hot topic, right? But predictive AI is, um, uh, how do you say, that the low hanging fruit um, which brings most of the business at the moment, right? We are still not there to um, yeah, make really uh, cost-effective business cases out of generative AI. And I will explain in the following why this is the case. Although I also, uh, in my opinion, AI is a big word, right? for something we do at the moment. Generative AI is just a tool, as Damir already pointed out. It's a next token prediction. It's already really a big leap, but it's, we are not there, right? So hopefully we all agree on that. So I just um, did a little research, right? Um, actually, I, uh, for me, it's also a reconciling loop to uh, get in touch with um, the, the newest developments, etc., like every one of us, I think. Um, so the cost of AI is really, um, especially for generative AI, is uh, overwhelming. So uh, we all know there are just a few big players um, that are basically um, 
yeah, uh, how do you say, uh, that in that opinionated game. So, uh, and they have um, the, the money basically to train such models and uh, to uh, bring it forward. Most of them, or the well-known uh, company, which I don't name here, um, are proprietary, right? And I explained beforehand, we are an open source minded company. So um, my view on this is um, maybe there should be an alternative and maybe is open source uh, a better alternative for, open, so for AI in the future. And um, as you can see here, um, there must be an alternative in some way, because if not, um, yeah, maybe things get, get weird in the future. So I did a short list of the players at the moment, right? And there is um, something to notice, right? So there are players that are still proprietary. They bring a lot of value to the table. That's uh, no question about it. They're also releasing white papers and uh, talking about their achievements, right? Which is good, uh, but they are not telling uh, the whole story. Uh, then on the other hand, you have other players that are at least releasing partly um, yeah, uh, quantized uh, versions of their models um, which are available to us and everyone can actually uh, experiment with them and can do uh, own product development with them without paying anything. That means even your son or your daughter uh, in their uh, room can actually, actually experiment with that. And um, all the cost pressure also led to uh, some developments that um, made really small models already so effective that they are really doing a good job as long as uh, it's not overwhelming, right? It's like uh, you can have a short, small chatbot um, that is uh, using a model with two, um, so a small model, um, that gives you good results, right? You can fine tune it in, in that sense. And then there are others just recently, like Meta, for example, that are completely open sourcing their work, um, which uh, seems to be a promising bet. Falcon AI should also be named, and um, others on, uh, like Mistral, for example. So, um, I just mentioned it. Um, Training is something that everyone can uh, afford. Inferencing um, is something we can do, right? It still costs uh, costly, but we um, might be able to do so. And what we need for that is a platform that helps us. So there are several um, methodologies that um, enable us um, to uh, fine tune and actually um, optimize the models we have uh, at our fingertips. And um, yeah, that's basically what uh, Dino also will be showing us uh, at a later point. So the place to be right now is a company uh, called um, Hugging Face. So there you're gonna find um, a lot of insights. They have something that is called the LLM uh, leaderboard for generative AI, but you also find uh, predictive AI models uh, on that website, which makes it really simple um, to work with uh, those and experiment. So the Y containers, uh, just in a few words, um, it's uh, the obvious reason, right? Uh, we can treat them as cattle. We don't uh, need to uh, give them names. Everything is a uh, declarative way, as we already knew it from the application development side. Uh, it makes it easy uh, for us to um, yeah, deploy and experiment and be, um, uh, to reach high densities on the server landscape. Um, yeah, the platform itself uh, already addresses many things, um, data scientists and um, the a machine learning workloads need like GPU support or third party um, uh, support of uh, whatsoever, right? So like TPUs or uh, storage whatsoever. Um, and 
we need a platform because of the complexity uh, topic, right? Uh, the model code um, itself doesn't um, is uh, isn't not enough uh, to actually deploy it into production. Um, so what we need there is a streamlined process and some guardrails um, that enable enterprises at a large scale to um, do it uh, in a professional and safe way. So um, the next three slides basically showcase uh, what we have to do. We all know um, those uh, processes more or less from um, application development, software development, right? So it's an iterative process. Um, we need to automate whatever is possible, but we also need, uh, at the same time, observability and security uh, functionality in there. Um, in looking at how um, roles play together in this scenario, uh, one thing is really obvious, or uh, points um, uh, here, is that the operations team has a lot of um, pressure Right, and a lot of responsibility to bring it into production, uh, which uh, sometimes is not really easy. So, but we are here to help. So the workflow of data uh, collection and cleaning, feature engineering and model development, etc., cetera, is um, an iterative process as uh, stated beforehand, right? At the end, you have uh, each and every part on the platform and you can um, implement your monitoring and your unit tests, et cetera, everything um, on, in the same manner. The tools we provide um, and we ship, so we support them, um, are uh, quite a lot, right? So we have the back end, uh, we um, support you with uh, GitOps and uh, DevOps tooling, we also have all the common um, tools to actually for model serving, like uh, KSERF or uh, Vino, etc. We also do um, trusty AI in combination with um, monitoring tools like Grafana and Prometheus. So I said it, observability is a big topic. Um, all the aforementioned tools are available to you. Um, Machine learning will not be successful if you are not have uh, if you do not have an observability uh, strategy at some point, right? It's not the work of data scientists to do that for you. Okay, um, yeah, and in case, just to shorten this a bit, in case you are still um, not innovative enough and you need to go to the bleeding edge because we cannot support every tool that is floating around in the business, um, there is still um, coverage through community projects, which means, for example, I was uh, uh, working in a bigger uh, context for uh, a bigger company. Uh, they use tools like Airflow, for example, or Apache Flink was also a topic recently. Um, those are available as operators and are available on the platform. So, but without actually <laughs> overdoing it and explaining too much without showing anything, now it's presentation time for Dino. Thank you, Francisco. So, like, the goal of my part is just to show you a short demo. Uh, and I'll start with, like, uh, the models, right? As Francisco said, uh, what are your models going to be, right? The big players have their own models. They are, you need to pay for them. You cannot use them freely, but for the purpose, we can use the Hugging Face platform. So like uh, Hugging Face opens some open source like solutions to the models, some data sets you can play with, and generally it's a very good first starting point uh, when you're developing your own models, right? Or you can just use their own models if you want. Uh, for the purpose of this demo, we use the Distilbert named entity recognizer. Uh, it's a model that's specialized in the predicting names, locations, organizations, and it's been fine-tuned already. So we prepared a small demo, right? And when you make your own project, you need to make a workbench. Workbench is going to supply you with an environment where you can play with your model. The workbench, you usually use it to play with your model, right? You get the trained data, you extract the features, clean the data, train the model, and then what you do is, like, 
push your model to the, an S3 data store, like Amazon. The one we prepared here is Minio, uh, and we put it like a pod on OpenShift, so it's already on OpenShift. And now, turn back. Um, okay. right, we go back to the console, and in the console, we put the model in, right? So like the workbench used to prepare the model, and then we served the model in the sorry, in the OpenShift. Um, where is it? All right, so the model is served, right? I served here, right? We served the model below. We, oh, I can't see it. No, it's not. Yeah, yeah, there, sorry. So we prepared the multimodal server. We put the, our model on the server. And now we're connecting our application with the model. And to see it in action, sorry, I'm going to go to the routes. Oh, how do you scroll down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There you go. And now in the routes, yeah. you can see how this looks like. So our application is connected to the model, right? We're sending the model information. And for example, we can type. So what it's going to do, you see, so like the data is sent to the model, to the model server, sorry. And then we retrieve predictions that are based on the tokens we sent to the model server. And now you can see the tokens that we got, right? So my was classified as other. Dino was classified as a person, the other as a location. And what we did is just mask those tokens depending on the prediction that we got from the model. And this is the end result. So you, you see how you can use like simple models from Hugging Face to do more complex things with your application, depending on the use case and the data you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys.